Section 18, chapters 51 to 53 of The Three Sisters by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 51 There was no prayer time at the vicarage any more. There was no more time at all there, as the world counts time. The hours no longer passed in a procession marked by distinguishable days. They rolled round and round in an interminable circle, monotonously renewed, monotonously returning upon itself. The vicar was the centre of the circle. The hours were sounded and measured by his monotonously recurring needs. But the days were neither measured nor marked. They were all of one shade. There was no difference between Sunday and Monday in the vicarage now. They talked of the vicar's good days and his bad days, that was all. For in this house where time had ceased, they talked incessantly of time. But it was always his time. The time for his early morning cup of tea. The time for his medicine. The time for his breakfast. The time for reading his chapter to him while he dozed. The time for washing him, for dressing him, for taking him out. He went out now in a wheelchair drawn by Peacock's pony. The time for his medicine again. His, his dinner time. The time for his afternoon sleep. His tea time the time for his last dose of medicine, his supper time, and his time for being undressed and put to bed. And there were several times during the night which were his times also. The vicar had desired supremacy in his vicarage, and he was at last supreme. He was supreme over his daughter Gwenda. The stubborn, intractable creature was at his feet. She was his to bend or break or utterly destroy. She who was capable of anything was capable of an indestructible devotion his times the relentless the monotonously recurring were her times too if it had not been for stephen rowcliffe she would have had none to call her own except night-time when the vicar slept but rowcliffe had kept to his days for visiting the vicarage he came twice or thrice a week not counting wednesdays only though mary did not know it he came as often as not in the evenings at dusk just after the vicar had been put to bed when it was wet he sat in the dining-room with gwenda when it was fine he took her out on to the moor under carva they always went the same way up the green sheep track that they knew they always turned back at the same place where the stream he had seen her jumping ran from the hill and they always took the same time to go and turn they never stopped and never lingered but went always at the same sharp pace and kept the same distance from each other it was as if by saying to themselves never any further than the stream never any longer than thirty-five minutes, never any nearer than we are now. They defined the limits of their whole relation. Sometimes they hardly spoke as they walked. They parted with casual words and with no touching of their hands, and with the same thought unspoken, till the next time. But these times which were theirs only did not count as time. They belonged to another scale of feeling and another order of reality. Their moments had another pulse, another rhythm and vibration they burned as they beat while they lasted gwenda's life was lived with an intensity that left time outside its measure through this intensity she drew the strength to go on to endure the unendurable with joy but rowcliffe could not endure the unendurable at all he was savage when he thought of it that was her life and she would never get away from it she who was born for the wild open air and for youth and strength and freedom would be shut up in that house and tied to that half-paralyzed, half-imbecile old man forever. It was damnable, and he, Rowcliffe, could have prevented it if he had only known, and if Mary had not lied to him. And when his common sense warned him of their danger, and his conscience reproached him with leading her into it, he said to himself, I can't help it if it is dangerous. It's been taken out of my hands. If somebody doesn't drag her out of doors, she'll get ill if somebody doesn't talk to her she'll grow morbid and there's nobody but me he sheltered himself in the immensity of her tragedy its darkness covered them her sadness and her isolation sanctified them alice had her husband and her child mary had all she wanted gwenda had nobody but him she had never had anybody but him for in the beginning the vicar and his daughters had failed to make friends among their own sort up in the dale there had been few to make in those few mr carteret had contrived to alienate one after another by his deplorable legend and by the austere unpleasantness of his personality people had not been prepared for intimacy with a vicar 
separated so outrageously from his third wife nobody knew whether it was he or his third wife who had been outrageous but the vicar's manner was not such as to procure for him the benefit of any doubt the fact remained that the poor man was handicapped by an outrageous daughter and alice's behaviour was obviously as much the vicar's fault as his misfortune and it had been felt that gwenda had not done anything to redeem her father's and her sister's eccentricities and that mary though she was a nice girl had hardly done enough for the last eighteen months visits at the vicarage had been perfunctory and very brief month by month they had diminished and before mary's marriage they had almost ceased still mary's marriage had appeased the parish mrs stephen rowcliffe had atoned for the third mrs carteret's suspicious absence and for gwenda carteret's flight lady frances gilby's large wing had further protected gwenda then suddenly the tale of alice carteret and greatorex went round and it was as if the vicarage had opened and given up its secret at first the sheer extremity of his disaster had sheltered the vicar from his own scandal through all garthdale and rathdale in the manors and the lodges and the granges in the farmhouses and the cottages in the inns and little shops there was a stir of pity and compassion the people who had left off calling at the vicarage called again with sympathy and kind inquiries they were inclined to forget how impossible the carterets had been they were sorry for gwenda but they had been checked in their advances by gwenda's palpable recoil she had no time to give to callers her father had taken all her time the callers considered themselves absolved from calling slowly month by month the vicarage was drawn back into its silence and its loneliness it assumed more and more its aspect of half sinister half sordid tragedy the vicar's calamity no longer sheltered him it took its place in the order of accepted and irremediable events only the village preserved its sympathy alive the village that obscure congregated soul long-suffering to calamity welded together by saner instincts and profound in memory the soul that inhabited the small huddled humbled houses divided from the vicarage by no more than the graveyard of its dead the village remembered and it knew it remembered how the vicar had come and gone over its thresholds how no rain nor snow nor storm had stayed him in his obstinate and punctual visiting and whereas it had once looked grimly on its vicar it looked kindly on him now it endured him for his daughter gwenda's sake in spite of what it knew for it knew why the vicar's third wife had left him it knew why alice carteret had gone wrong with greatorex it knew what gwenda carteret had gone for when she went away it knew why and how dr rowcliffe had married mary carteret and it knew why night after night he was to be seen coming and going on the garthdale road the village knew more about rowcliffe and gwenda carteret than rowcliffe's wife knew for rowcliffe's wife's mind was closed to this knowledge by a certain sensual assurance when all was said and done it was she and not gwenda who was rowcliffe's wife and she had other grounds for complacency her sister a solitary miss carteret stowed away in garth vicarage was of no account she didn't matter and as mary carteret mary would have mattered even less but stephen rowcliffe's professional reputation served him well he counted people who had begun by trusting him had ended by liking him and in two years time his social value had become apparent and as mrs stephen rowcliffe mary had a social value too but while stephen who had always had it took it for granted and never thought about it mary could think of nothing else her social value obscured by the terrible two years in garthdale had come to her as a discovery and an acquisition for all her complacency she could not regard it as a secure thing she was sensitive to every breath that threatened it she was unable to forget that if she was stephen rowcliffe's wife she was alice greatorex's sister even as mary carteret she had been sensitive to alice but in those days of obscurity and isolation it was not in her to cast alice off she had felt bound to alice not as gwenda was bound but pitiably irrevocably for better for worse the solidarity of the family had held she had not had anything to lose by sticking to her sister now it seemed to her that she had everything to lose the thought of alice was a perpetual annoyance to her for the neighbourhood that had received mrs stephen rowcliffe had barred her sister as long as alice greatorex lived at upthorne 
Mary went in fear. This fear was so intolerable to her that at last she spoke of it to Rowcliffe. They were sitting together in his study after dinner. The two armchairs were always facing now, one on each side of the hearth. I wish I knew what to do about Alice, she said. What to do about her? Yes. Am I to have her at the house or not? He stared. Of course you're to have her at the house. I mean, when we've got people here, I can't ask her to meet them. Well, you must ask her. It's the very least you can do for her. People aren't going to like it, Stephen. People have got to stick a great many things they aren't going to like. I'm continually meeting people I'd rather not meet, aren't you? I'm afraid poor Alice is... is what? Well, dear, a little impossible, to say the least of it, isn't she? He shrugged his shoulders. I don't see anything impossible about poor Alice. I never did. It's nice of you to say so. He maintained himself in silence under her long gaze. Stephen, she said, you are awfully good to my people. She saw that she could hardly have said anything that would have annoyed him more. He positively writhed with irritation. I'm not in the least good to your people. The word stung her like a blow. She flushed and he softened. Can't you see, Molly, that I hate the infernal humbug and the cruelty of it all? That poor child had a dog's life before she was married. She did the only sane thing that was open to her. You've only got to look at her now to see that she couldn't have done much better for herself even if she hadn't been driven to it. What's more, she's done the best thing for Greatorex. There isn't another woman in the world who could have made that chap chuck drinking. You mayn't like the connection. I don't suppose any of us like it. My dear Stephen, it isn't only the connection. I could get over that. It's the other thing. His blank stare compelled her to precision. I mean, what happened? Well, if Gwenda can get over the other thing, I should think you might. She has to see more of her. It's different for Gwenda. How is it different for Gwenda? She hesitated. She had meant that Gwenda hadn't anything to lose. What she said was, Gwenda hasn't anybody but herself to think of. She hasn't let you in for Alice. No more have you. He smiled. Mary did not understand either his answer or his smile. He was saying to himself, Oh, hasn't she? It was Gwenda all the time who let me in. Mary had a little rush of affection. My dear, I think I've let you in for everything. I wouldn't mind, I wouldn't really, if it wasn't for you. You needn't bother about me, he said. I'd rather you bothered about your sister. Which sister? For the life of her, she could not tell what had made her say that. The words seemed to leap out suddenly from her mind to her tongue. Alice, he said. Was it Alice we were talking about? It was Alice I was thinking about, was it? Again her mind took its insane possession of her tongue. The evening dragged on. The two chairs still faced each other, pushed forward in their attitude of polite attention and expectancy. But the persons in the chairs leaned back, as if each withdrew as far as possible from the other. They made themselves stiff and upright as if they braced themselves, each against the other in the unconscious tension of hostility and they were silent, each thinking an intolerable thought. Rowcliffe had taken up a book and was pretending to read it. Mary's hands were busy with her knitting. Her needles went with a rapid jerk, driven by the vibration of her irritated nerves. From time to time she glanced at Rowcliffe under her bent brows. She saw the same blocks of print, a deep block at the top, a short line under it, then a narrower block. She saw them as vague, meaningless blurs of grey, stippled on white. She saw that Rowcliffe's eyes never moved from the deep top paragraph on the left-hand page. She noted the light pressure of his thumbs on the margins. He wasn't reading at all. He was only pretending to read. He had set up his book as a barrier between them, and he was holding on to it for dear life. Rowcliffe moved irritably under Mary's eyes. She lowered them and waited for the silken sound that should have told her that he had turned a page. And all the time she kept on saying to herself, he was thinking about gwenda he's sorry for alice because of gwenda not because of me it isn't my people that he's good to the thought went round and round in mary's mind troubling its tranquillity she knew that something followed from it but she refused to see it her mind thrust from it the conclusion then it's gwenda that he cares for she said to herself after all i'm married to him and as she said it she thrust up her chin in a gesture of assurance and defiance in the chair that faced her, Rowcliffe shifted his position. He crossed his legs, and the tilted foot kicked out, urged by a hidden savagery. 
The clicking of Mary's needles maddened him. He glanced at her. She was knitting a silk tie for his birthday. She saw the glance. The fierceness of the small fingers slackened. They knitted off a row or two, then ceased. Her hands lay quiet in her lap. She leaned her head against the back of the chair. Her grieved eyes let down their lids before the smouldering hostility in his. Her stillness and her shut eyes moved him to compunction. They appeased him with reminiscence, with suggestion of her smooth and innocent sleep. He had been thinking of what she had done to him, of how she had lied to him about Gwenda, of the abominable thing that Alice had cried out to him in her agony. The thought of Mary's turpitude had consoled him mysteriously. Instead of putting it from him, he had dwelt on it. He had wallowed in it. He had let it soak into him till he was poisoned with it. For the sting of it and the violence of his own resentment were more tolerable to Rowcliffe than the stale, dull realization of the fact that Mary bored him. It had come to that. He had nothing to say to Mary now that he had married her. His romantic youth still moved uneasily within him. It found no peace in an armchair facing Mary. He dreaded these evenings that he was compelled to spend with her. He dreaded her speech. He dreaded her silences ten times more. They no longer soothed him. They were pervading, menacing, significant. He thought that Mary's turpitude accounted for and justified the exasperation of his nerves. Now as he looked at her lying back in the limp pose reminiscent of her sleep, he thought, poor thing, poor Molly. He put down his book. He stood over her a moment, sighed a long sigh like a yawn, turned from her and went to bed. Mary opened her eyes, sighed, stretched herself, put out the light, and followed him. Chapter 52 Not long after that night it struck Mary that Stephen was run down. He worked too hard. That was how she accounted to herself for his fits of exhaustion, of irritability, and depression. But secretly, for all her complacence, she had divined the cause. She watched him now. She inquired into his goings out and comings in. Sometimes she knew that he had been to Garthdale, and though he went there many more times than she knew, she had noticed that these moods of his followed invariably on his going. It was as if Gwenda left her mark on him. So much was certain, and by that certainty she went on to infer his going from his mood. One day she taxed him with it. Rowcliffe had tried to excuse his early morning temper on the plea that he was beastly tired. Tired, she had said. Of course you're tired if you went up to Garthdale last night. She added, it isn't necessary. He was silent, and she knew that she was on his trail. Two evenings later, she caught him as he was leaving the house. Where are you going, she said. I'm going up to Garthdale to see your father. Her eyes flinched. You saw him yesterday. I did. Is he worse? He hesitated. Lying had not as yet come lightly to him. I'm not easy about him, he said. She was not satisfied. She had caught the hesitation. Can't you tell me, she persisted, if he's worse? He looked at her calmly. I can't tell you till I've seen him. That roused her. She bit her lip. She knew that whatever she did, she must not show temper. Did Gwenda send for you? Her voice was quiet. She did not. He strode out of the house. After that, he never told her when he was going up to Garthdale toward nightfall. He was sometimes driven to lie. It was up Rathdale he was going, or to Greffington, or to smoke a pipe with Ned Alderson, or to turn in for a game of billiards at the village club. And whenever he lied to her, she saw through him. She was prepared for the lie. She said to herself, he's going to see Gwenda. He can't keep away from her. And then she remembered what Alice had said to her. You'll know some day. She knew. Chapter 53 And with her knowledge there came a curious calm. She no longer watched and worried Rowcliffe. She knew that no wife ever kept her husband by watching and worrying him. She was aware of danger, and she faced it with restored complacency. For Mary was a fount of sensual wisdom. Rowcliffe was ill, and from his illness she inferred his misery, and from his misery his innocence. She told herself that nothing had happened, that she knew nothing that she had not known before. She saw that her mistake had been in showing that she knew it. That was to admit it, and to admit it was to give it a substance, a shape and color it had never had and was not likely to have. And Mary, having perceived her blunder, set herself to repair it. She knew how. 
under all his energy she had discerned in her husband a love of bodily ease and a capacity for laziness undeveloped because perpetually frustrated insidiously she had set herself to undermine his energy while she devised continual opportunities for ease rowcliffe remained incurably energetic his profession demanded energy still there were ways by which he could be captured he was not so deeply absorbed in his profession as to be indifferent to the arrangements of his home he liked and he showed very plainly that he liked good food and silent service the shining of glass and silver white table linen and fragrant sheets for his bed with all these things mary had provided him and she had her own magic and her way her way the way she had caught him was the way she would keep him she had always known her power even unpractised she had always known by instinct how she could enthrall him when her moment came gwenda had put back the hour but she had done and mary argued that therefore she could do no more here mary's complacency betrayed her she had fallen into the error of all innocent and tranquil sensualists she trusted to the present she had reckoned without rowcliffe's future or his past and she had done even worse by habituating rowcliffe's senses to her way she had produced in him through sheer satisfaction that sense of security which is the most dangerous sense of all end of section eighteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine section nineteen chapter fifty four of the three sisters by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter fifty four one week in june rowcliffe went up to garthdale two nights running he had never done this before and he had had to lie badly about it both to himself and mary he had told himself that the first evening didn't count for he had quarrelled with gwenda the first evening neither of them knew how it had happened or what it was about but he had hardly come before he had left her in his anger the actual outburst moved her only to laughter but the memory of it was violent in her nerves it shook and shattered her she had not slept all night and in the morning she woke tired and ill and as if he had known what he had done to her he came to see her the next evening to make up that night they stayed out later than they had meant as they touched the moor the lambs stirred at their mother's sides and the peewits rose and followed the white road to lure them from their secret places they wheeled and wheeled round them sending out their bored and weary cry in june the young broods kept the moor and the two were forced to the white road and at the turn they came in sight of greffington edge she stood still oh stephen look she said he stood with her and looked the moon was hidden in the haze where the grey day and the white night were mixed across the bottom on the dim watery green of the eastern slope the thorn trees were in flower the hot air held them like still water it quivered invisibly loosening their scent and scattering it and of a sudden she saw them as if thrown back to a distance where they stood enchanted in a great stillness and clearness and a piercing beauty there went through her a sudden deep excitement a subtle and mysterious joy this passion was as distant and as pure as ecstasy it swept her while the white glamour lasted into the stillness where the flowering thorn trees stood she wondered whether stephen had seen the vision of the flowering thorn trees she longed for him to see it they stood a little apart and her hand moved toward him without touching him as if she would draw him to the magic stephen she said he came to her her hand hung limply by her side again she felt his hand close on it and press it she knew that he had seen the vision and felt the subtle and mysterious joy she wanted nothing more say good night now she said not yet i'm going to walk back with you they walked back in a silence that guarded the memory of the mystic thing they lingered a moment by the half-open door she on the threshold he on the garden path the width of a flagstone separated them in another minute she thought he will be gone it seemed to her that he wanted to be gone and that it was she who held him there against his will and her own she drew the door to don't shut it gwenda it was as if he said don't let's stand together out here like this any longer she opened the door again leaning a little toward it across the threshold with her hand on the latch 
she smiled raising her chin in the distant gesture that was their signal of withdrawal but stephen did not go may i come in he said something in her said don't let him come in but she did not heed it the voice was thin and small and utterly insignificant as if one little brain cell had waked up and started speaking on its own account and something seized on her tongue and made it say yes and the full tide of her blood surged into her throat and choked it and neither the one voice nor the other seemed to be her own he followed her into the little dining-room where the lamp was the vicar was in bed the whole house was still rowcliffe looked at her in the lamplight we walked a bit too far he said he made her lean back on the couch he put a pillow at her head and a footstool at her feet just rest he said and she rested but rowcliffe did not rest he moved uneasily about the room a sudden tiredness came over her she thought yes we walked too far she leaned her head back on the cushion her thin arms lay stretched out on either side of her supported by the couch rowcliffe ceased to wander he drew up with his back against the chimney-piece where he faced her close your eyes he said she did not close them but the tired lids drooped the lifted bow of her mouth drooped the small sharp pointed breasts drooped and as he watched her he remembered how he had quarrelled with her in that room last night and the thought of his brutality was intolerable to him his heart ached with tenderness and his tenderness was intolerable too the small white face with its suffering eyes and drooping eyelids the drooping breasts the thin white arms slackened along the couch the childlike helplessness of the tired body moved him with a vehement desire and his strength that had withstood her in her swift defiant beauty melted away stephen don't speak he said she was quiet for a moment but i want to stephen i want to say something he sighed well say it it's something i want to ask you don't ask impossibilities i don't think it's impossible at least it wouldn't be if you really knew i want you to be more careful with me she paused he turned from her abruptly his turning made it easier for her she went on it's only a little thing a silly little thing i want you when you're angry with me not to show it quite so much he had turned again to her suddenly the look on his face stopped her i'm never angry with you he said i know you aren't really i know i know but you make me think you are and it hurts so terribly i didn't know you minded i don't always mind but sometimes when i'm stupid i simply can't bear it it makes me feel as if i'd done something last night i got it into my head what did you get into your head tell me i thought i'd made you hate me i thought you thought i was awful like poor ally you he drew a long breath and sent it out again you know what i think of you he looked at her threw up his head suddenly and went to her his words came fast now and thick you know i love you that's why i've been such a brute to you because i couldn't have you in my arms and it made me mad and you know it that's what you mean when you say it hurts you you shan't be hurt any more i'm going to end it he stooped over her suddenly steadying himself by his two hands laid on the back of her chair she put out her arms and pushed with her hands against his shoulders as if she would have beaten him off he sank to her knees and there caught her hands in his and kissed them he held them together helpless with his left arm and his right arm gathered her to him violently and close his mouth came crushing upon her parted lips and her shut eyes her small thin hands struggled piteously in his and for pity he released them he felt them pushing with their silk soft palms against his face their struggle and their resistance were pain to him and exquisite pleasure not that stephen not that oh i didn't think i didn't think you would don't send me away gwenda it's all right we've suffered enough we've got to end it this way no not this way yes yes it's all right darling we've struggled till you can't struggle any more you must why not when you love me he pressed her closer in his arms she lay quiet there when she was quiet he let her speak i can't she said it's molly poor little molly don't talk to me of molly she lied about you whatever she did she couldn't help it whatever we do now we can't help it we can we're different oh don't don't hold me like that i can't bear it 
His arms tightened. His mouth found hers again as if he had not heard her. She gave a faint cry that pierced him. He looked at her. The lips he had kissed were a purplish white in her thin, bloodless face. I say, are you ill? She saw her advantage and took it. No, but I can't stand things very well. They make me ill. That's what I meant when I asked you to be careful. Her helplessness stilled his passion as it had roused it. He released her suddenly. He took the thin arm, surrendered to his gentleness, turned back her sleeve and felt the tense, jerking pulse. He saw what she had meant. Do you mind my sitting beside you if I keep quiet? She shook her head. Can you stand my talking about it? Yes, if you don't touch me. I won't touch you. We've got to face the thing. It's making you ill. It isn't. Well, what is, then? Living with Papa. He smiled through his agony. That's only another name for it. It can't go on. Why shouldn't we be happy? Why shouldn't we, he insisted. It's not as if we hadn't tried. I can't. You're afraid? Oh, no, I'm not afraid. It's simply that I can't. You think it's a sin? It isn't. It's we who are sinned against. If you're afraid of deceiving Mary, I don't care if I do. She deceived me first. Besides, we can't. She knows and she doesn't mind. She can't suffer as you suffer. She can't feel as you feel. She can't care. She does care. She must have cared horribly or she wouldn't have done it. She didn't. Anybody would have done for her as well as me. I tell you, I don't want to talk about Mary or to think about her. Then I must. No. You must think of me. You don't owe anything to Mary. It's me you're sinning against. You think a lot about sinning against Mary, but you think nothing about sinning against me. When did I ever sin against you? Last year, when you went away. That was the beginning of it all. Why did you go, Gwenda? You knew. We should have been all right if you hadn't. I went because of Allie. She had to be married. I thought perhaps if I wasn't there... That I'd marry her? Good God, Allie! What on earth made you think I'd do that? I wouldn't have married her if there hadn't been another woman in the world. I couldn't be sure, but after what you said about her, I had to give her a chance. What did I say? That she'd die or go mad if somebody didn't marry her. I never said that. I wouldn't be likely to. But you did, dear. You frightened me. So I went away to see if that would make it any better. Any better for whom? For Allie. Oh, Allie, I see. I thought if it didn't, if you didn't marry her, I could come back again, and when I did come back, you'd married Mary. And Mary knew that? There's no good bothering about Mary now. Utterly weary of their strife, she lay back and closed her eyes. Poor Gwenda. Again he had compassion on her. He waited. You see how it was, she said. It doesn't help us much, dear. What are we going to do? Not what you want, Stephen, I'm afraid. Not now, but some day. You'll see it differently when you've thought of it. Never, never any day. I've had all these months to think of it, and I can't see it differently yet. You have thought of it? Not like that. But you did think. You knew it would come to this. I tried not to make it come. Do you know why I tried? I don't think it was for Molly. It was for myself. It was because I wanted to keep you. That's why I shall never do what you want. But that's how you would keep me. There's no other way. She rose with a sudden gesture of her shoulders, as if she shook off the obsession of him. She stood leaning against the chimney-piece in the attitude he knew, an attitude of long-limbed, insolent, adolescent grace that gave her the advantage. Her eyes disdained their pathos. They looked at him with laughter under their dropped lids. How funny we are, she said, when we know all the time we couldn't really do a caddish thing like that. He smiled queerly. I suppose we couldn't. He too rose and faced her. Do you know what this means, he said? It means that I've got to clear out of this. Oh, Stephen. The brave light in her face went out. You wouldn't go away and leave me. God knows I don't want to leave you, Gwenda, but we can't go on like this. How can we? I could. Well, I can't. That's what it means to me. That's what it means to a man. If we're going to be straight, we simply mustn't see each other. Do you mean for always? That we're never to see each other again? Yes, if it's to be any good. Stephen, I can bear anything but that. It can't mean that. I tell you, it's what it means for me. There's no good talking about it. You've seen what I've been like tonight. This? This is nothing. You'll get over this, but think what it would mean to me. 
It would be hard, I know. Hard? Not half so hard as this. But I can bear this. We've been so happy. We can be happy still. This isn't happiness. It's my happiness. It's all I've got. It's all I've ever had. What is? Seeing you, or not even seeing you, knowing you're there. Poor child, does that make you happy? Utterly happy, always. I didn't know. He stooped forward, hiding his face in his hands. You don't realize it. You've no idea what it'll mean to be boxed up in this place together all our lives, with this between us. It's always been between us. We shall be no worse off. It may have been bad now and then, but conceive what it'll be like when you go. I suppose it would be pretty beastly for you if I did go. Would it be too awful for you if you stayed? It was a long time before he answered. Not if it really made you happier. Happier? She smiled her pitiful, strained smile. It said, don't you see that it would kill me if you went? And again, it was by her difference, her helplessness, that she had him. He too smiled drearily. You don't suppose I really could have left you? He saw that it was impossible, unthinkable, that he should leave her. He rose. She went with him to the door. She thought of something there. Stephen, she said, don't worry about tonight. It was all my fault. You, you, he murmured. You're adorable. It was, really, she said. I made you come in. She gave him her cold hand. He raised it and brushed it with his lips and put it from him. Your little conscience was always too tender. End of section 19. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Section 20, chapters 55 to 58 of The Three Sisters by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 55 Two years passed. Life stirred again in the vicarage, feebly and slowly, with the slow and feeble stirring of the vicar's brain. Ten o'clock was prayer time again. Twice every Sunday the vicar appeared in his seat in the chancel. Twice he pronounced the absolution. Twice he tottered to the altar rails, turned, shifted his stick from his left hand to his right, and with his one good arm raised he gave the benediction. These were the supreme moments of his life. Once a month, kneeling at the same altar rails, he received the bread and wine from the hands of his ritualistic curate, Mr. Grierson. It was his uttermost abasement. But whether he was abased or exalted, the parish was proud of its vicar. He had shown grit. His parishioners respected the indestructible instinct that had made him hold on. For Mr. Carter it was better, incredibly better. He could creep about the house and the village without any help but his stick. He could wash and feed and dress himself. He had no longer any use for his wheelchair. Once a week, on a Wednesday, he was driven over his parish in an ancient pony carriage of peacocks. It was low enough for him to haul himself in and out and he had recovered large tracts of memory, all, apparently, but the one spot submerged in the catastrophe that had brought about his stroke. He was aware of events, and of their couplings, and of their sequences in time, though the origin of some things was not clear to him. Thus he knew that Alice was married and living at Upthorne, though he had forgotten why. That she should have married Greatorex was a strange thing, and he couldn't think how it had happened. He supposed it must have happened when he was laid aside, for he would never have permitted it if he had known. Mary's marriage also puzzled him, for he had a most distinct idea that it was Gwenda who was to have married Rowcliffe, and he said so, but he would own humbly that he might be mistaken, his memory not being what it was. He had settled more or less into his state of gentleness and submission, broken from time to time by fits of violent irritation and relieved by pride, pride in his feats of independence, his comings and goings, his washing, his dressing and undressing of himself. Sometimes his pride was stubborn and insistent. Sometimes it was sweet and joyous as a child's. His mouth, relaxed forever by his stroke, had acquired a smile of piteous and appealing innocence. It smiled upon the just and upon the unjust. It smiled even on Greatorex, whom socially he disapproved of. He took care to let it be known that he disapproved of Greatorex socially, though he tolerated him. He 
he tolerated all persons except one and that one was the ritualistic curate mr grierson he had every reason for not tolerating him not only was mr grierson a ritualist which was only less abominable than being a nonconformist but he had been foisted on him without his knowledge or will the vicar had suddenly waked up one day out of his confused twilight to a state of fearful lucidity and found the young man there worse than all it was through the third mrs carteret that he had got there for the vicar of greffington had applied to the additional curate's aid society for a grant on behalf of his afflicted brother the vicar of garthdale and he had applied in vain there was a prejudice against the vicar of garthdale but the vicar of greffington did not relax his efforts he applied to young mrs rowcliffe and young mrs rowcliffe applied to her stepmother and not in vain robina answering by return of post offered to pay half the curate's salary rowcliffe made himself responsible for the other half robina in her compact little house in st john's wood had become the prey of remorse her conscience had begun to bother her by suggesting that she ought to go back to her husband now that he was helpless and utterly inoffensive she ought not to leave him on poor gwenda's hands she ought at any rate to take her turn but robina couldn't face it she couldn't leave her compact little house and go back to her husband she couldn't even take her turn flesh and blood shrank from the awful sacrifice it would be a living death your conscience has no business to send you to a living death robina's heart ached for poor gwenda she wrote and said so she said she knew she was a brute for not going back to gwenda's father she would do it if she could but she simply couldn't she hadn't got the nerve and robina did more she pulled wires and found the curate that he was a ritualist was no drawback in robina's eyes in fact she declared it was a positive advantage mr grierson's practices would wake them up in garthdale they needed waking she had added that mr grierson was well connected well behaved and extremely good-looking even charity couldn't subdue the merry devil in robina i can't see said mary reading robina's letter what mr grierson's good looks have got to do with it rowcliffe's face darkened he thought he could see but mr grierson did not wake garthdale up it opened one astonished eye on his practices and turned over in its sleep again mr grierson was young and the village regarded all he did as the folly of his youth it saw no harm in mr grierson not even when he conceived a platonic passion for mrs stephen rowcliffe and spent all his spare time in her drawing-room and on his way to and from it the curate lodged in the village at the blenkirons over rowcliffe's surgery and from that vantage ground he lay in wait for rowcliffe he watched his movements he was ready at any moment to fling open his door and spring upon rowcliffe with ardour and enthusiasm it was as if he wanted to prove to him how heartily he forgave him for being mrs rowcliffe's husband there was a robust innocence about him that ignored the doctor's irony mary had her own use for mr grierson his handsome figure assiduous but restrained the perfect image of integrity and adoration was the very thing she wanted for her drawing-room she knew that its presence there had the effect of heightening her own sensual attraction it served as a reminder to rowcliffe that his wife was a woman of charm a fact which for some time he appeared to have forgotten she could play off her adorer against her husband while the candid purity of young grierson's homage renewed her exquisite sense of her own goodness and then the curate really was a cousin of lord northfleet's and mrs rowcliffe had calculated that to have him in her pocket would increase prodigiously her social value and it did and mrs rowcliffe's social value when observed by grierson increased his adoration and when rowcliffe told her that young grierson's platonic friendship wasn't good for him she made wide eyes at him and said poor boy he must have some amusement she didn't suppose the curate could be much amused by calling at the vicarage young grierson had confided to her that he couldn't make her sister out i never knew anybody who could she said and gave him a subtle look that disturbed him horribly i only meant he stammered and stopped for he wasn't quite sure what he did mean his fair fresh face was strained with the effort to express himself he meditated you know she's really rather fascinating you can't help looking at her only she doesn't seem to see that you're there i suppose that's what puts you off i know it does dreadfully said mary 
she summoned a flash and let him have it but she's magnificent magnificent he echoed with his robust enthusiasm but what he thought was that it was magnificent of mrs rowcliffe to praise her sister and rowcliffe smiled grimly at young grierson and his platonic passion he said to himself if i'd only known if i'd only had the sense to wait six months grierson would have done just as well for molly still he welcomed him and his platonic passion it wasn't good for grierson but it was good for molly at least he supposed it was better for her than nothing and for him it was infinitely better it kept grierson off gwenda young grierson was right when he said that gwenda didn't see that he was there he had been two years in garthdale and she was as far from seeing it as ever he didn't mind he was even amused by her indifference only he couldn't help thinking that it was rather odd of her considering that he was there the village as simple in its thinking as young grierson shared his view it thought that it was something more than odd and it had a suspicion that mrs rowcliffe was at the bottom of it she wouldn't be happy if she didn't get that young man away from her sister the village hinted that it wouldn't be for the first time but in two years with the gradual lifting of the pressure that had numbed her gwenda had become aware not of young grierson but of her own tragedy of the slow life that dragged her of its relentless motion and its mass now that her father's need of her was intermittent she was alive to the tightness of the tie it had been less intolerable when it had bound her tighter when she hadn't had a moment when it had dragged her all the time its slackening was torture she pulled then and was jerked on her chain it was not only that rowcliffe's outburst had waked her and made her cruelly aware he had timed it badly in her moment of revived lucidity the moment when she had become vulnerable again she was the more sensitive because of her previous apathy as if she had died and was new-born to suffering and virgin to pain what hurt her most was her father's gentleness she could stand his fits of irritation and obstinacy they braced her they called forth her will but she was defenceless against his pathos and he knew it he had phrases that wrung her heart you're a good girl gwenda i'm only an irritable old man my dear you mustn't mind what i say she suffered from the incessant drain on her pity for she wanted all her will if she was to stand against rowcliffe pity was a dangerous solvent in which her will sank and was melted away there were moments when she saw herself as two women one had still the passion and the memory of freedom the other was a cowed and captive creature who had forgotten whose cramped motions guided her whose instinct of submission she abhorred her isolation was now extreme she had had nothing to give to any friend she might have made rowcliffe had taken all that was left of her and now when intercourse was possible it was they who had withdrawn they shared mr grierson's inability to make her out they had heard rumours they imagined things they remembered also she was the girl who had raced all over the country with dr rowcliffe the girl whom dr rowcliffe for all their racing had not cared to marry she was the girl who had run away from home to live with a dubious stepmother and she was the sister of that awful mrs greatorex who well everybody knew what mrs greatorex was gwenda carteret like her younger sister had been talked about not so much in the big houses of the dale the queer facts had been tossed up and down a smoke-room for one season and then dropped in the big houses they didn't remember gwenda carteret they only remembered to forget her but in the little shops and in the little houses in morfe there had been continual whispering they said that even after dr rowcliffe's marriage to that nice wife of his who was her own sister the two had been carrying on if there wasn't any actual harm done and maybe there wasn't the doctor had been running into danger he was up at garthdale more than he need be now that the old vicar was about again and they had been seen together the head gamekeeper at garthdale had caught them more than once out on the moor and after dark too it was said in the little houses that it wasn't the doctor's fault in the big houses judgment had been more impartial but morfe was loyal to its doctor it was hers every bit you might depend on it of rowcliffe it was said that maybe he'd been tempted but he was a good man was dr rowcliffe and he'd stopped in time because they didn't know what gwenda carteret was capable of they believed like the vicar that she was capable of anything it was only in her own village that they knew the head gamekeeper had never told his tale in garth 
it would have made him too unpopular gwenda carteret remained unaware of what was said rumour protected her by cutting her off from its own sources and she had other consolations besides her ignorance so long as she knew that rowcliffe cared for her and always had cared it did not seem to matter to her so much that he had married mary she actually considered that of the two mary was the one to be pitied it was so infinitely worse to be married to a man who didn't care for you than not to be married to a man who did of course there was the tie her sister had outward and visible possession of him but she said to herself i wouldn't give what i have for that if i can't have both and of course there was stephen and stephen's misery which was more unbearable to her than her own at least she thought it was more unbearable she didn't ask herself how bearable it would have been if stephen's marriage had brought him a satisfaction that denied her and cast her out for she was persuaded that stephen also had his consolation he knew that she cared for him she conceived this knowledge of theirs as constituting an immaterial and immutable possession of each other and it did not strike her that this knowledge might be less richly compensating to stephen than to her her woman's passion forced inward sustained her with an inward peace and inward exaltation and in this peace this exaltation it became one with her passion for the place she was unaware of what was happening in her she did not know that her soul had joined the two beyond its own power to put asunder she still looked on her joy in the earth as a solitary emotion untouched by any other she still said to herself nothing can take this away from me for she had hours now and again when she shook off the slave-woman who held her down in those hours her inner life moved with the large rhythm of the seasons and was soaked in the dyes of the visible world and the visible world passing into her inner life took on its radiance and intensity everything that happened and that was great and significant in its happening happened there outside nothing happened nothing stood out nothing moved no procession of events trod down or blurred her perfect impressions of the earth and sky they eternalized themselves in memory they became her memory the days were carved for her in the lines of the hills and painted for her in their colors days that were dim green and gray when the dreaming land was withdrawn under a veil so fine that it had the transparency of water or when the stone walls the humble houses and the high ramparts drenched with mist and with secret sunlight became insubstantial days when all the hills were hewn out of one opal days that had the form of carva under snow and the thin blues and violets of the snow she remembered purely without thinking it was in april that i went away from stephen or it was in november that he married mary or it was in february that we knew about ally and father had his stroke her nature was sound and sane it refused to brood over suffering she was not like alice and in her unlikeness she lacked some of alice's resources she couldn't fling herself on to a polonaise of a sonata any more than she could lie on a couch all day and look at her own white hands and dream her passion found no outlet in creating violent and voluptuous sounds it was passive rather and attentive cut off from all contacts of the flesh it turned to the distant and the undreamed its very senses became infinitely subtle they discerned the hidden soul of the land that had entranced her there were no words for this experience she had no sense of self in it and needed none it seemed to her that she was what she contemplated as if all her senses were fused together in the sense of seeing and what her eyes saw they heard and touched and felt but when she came to and saw herself seeing she said at least this is mine nobody not even stephen can take it away from me she also reminded herself that she had alice she meant alice greatorex alice carteret oppressed by her own awfulness had loved her with a sullen selfish love the love of a frustrated and unhappy child but there was no awfulness in alice greatorex in the fine sanity of happiness she showed herself as good as gold marriage that had made mary hard made alice tender mary was wrapped up in her husband and her house and in her social relations and young grierson's platonic passion so tightly wrapped that these things formed round her an impenetrable shell they hid a secret and inaccessible mary alice was wrapped up in her husband and children in the boy of three who was so like gwenda 
and in the baby girl who was so like greatorex but through them she had become approachable she had the ways of some happy household animal its quick rushes of affection and its gaze the long spiritual gaze of its maternity mysterious and appealing she loved gwenda with a sad-eyed remorseful love she said to herself if i hadn't been so awful gwenda might have married stephen she saw the appalling extent of gwenda's sacrifice she saw it as it was monstrous absurd altogether futile it was the futility of it that troubled alice most even if gwenda had been capable of sacrificing herself for mary which had been by no means her intention that would have been futile too alice was of rowcliffe's opinion that young grierson would have done every bit as well for mary better for mary had no children and how said alice could she expect to have them she saw in mary's childlessness not only god's but nature's justice there were moments when mary saw it too but she left god out of it and called it nature's cruelty if it was not really gwenda for in flashes of extreme lucidity mary put it down to rowcliffe's coldness and she had come to know that gwenda was responsible for that chapter fifty six but one day in april in the fourth year of her marriage mary sent for gwenda rowcliffe was out on his rounds she had thought of that she was fond of having gwenda with her in rowcliffe's absence when she could talk to her about him in a way that assumed his complete indifference to gwenda and utter devotion to herself gwenda was used to this habit of mary's and thought nothing of it she found her in rowcliffe's study the room that she knew better than any other in his house the window was closed the panes cut up the colours of the orchard and framed them in small squares mary received her with a gentle voice and a show of tenderness she said very little they had tea together and when gwenda would have gone mary kept her she still said very little she seemed to brood over some happy secret presently she spoke she told her secret and when she had told it she turned her eyes to gwenda with a look of subtle penetration and of triumph at last she said after three years and she added i knew you would be glad i am glad said gwenda she was glad she was determined to be glad she looked glad and she kissed mary and said again that she was very glad but as she walked back the four miles up garthdale under carva she felt an aching at her heart which was odd considering how glad she was she said to herself i will be glad i want mary to be happy why shouldn't i be glad it's not as if it could make any difference chapter fifty seven in september mary sent for her again mary was very ill she lay on her bed and rowcliffe and her sister stood on either side of her she gazed from one to the other with eyes of terror and entreaty it was as if she cried out to them the two who were so strong to help her she stretched out her arms on the counterpane one arm toward each of them her little hands palm upward implored them each of them laid a hand in mary's hand that closed on it with a clutch of agony rowcliffe had sat up all night with her his face was white and haggard and there was fear and misery in his eyes they never looked at gwenda's lest they should see the same fear and the same misery there it was as if they had no love for each other only a profound and secret pity that sprang in both of them from their fear only once they found each other outside on the landing when they had left mary alone with hislop the old doctor from rayburn and the nurse each spoke once stephen is there really any danger yes i wish to god i'd had harker do you mind sending him a wire i must go and see what that fool hislop's doing he turned back again into the room gwenda went out and sent the wire but at noon before harker could come to them it was over mary lay as alice had lain weak and happy with her child tucked in the crook of her arm and she smiled at it dreamily the old doctor and the nurse smiled at rowcliffe it couldn't they said have gone off more easily there hadn't been any danger nor any earthly reason to have sent for harker though of course if it had made rowcliffe happier the old doctor added that if it had been anybody else's wife rowcliffe would have known that it was going all right and in the evening when her sister stood again at her bedside as mary lifted the edge of the flannel that hid her baby's face she looked at gwenda and smiled not dreamily but subtly in a triumph that was almost malign that night gwenda dreamed that she saw mary lying dead 
and with a dead child in the crook of her arm she woke in anguish and terror chapter fifty eight three years passed and six months the carterets had been in garthdale nine years gwenda carteret sat in the dining-room at the vicarage alone with her father it was nearly ten o'clock of the march evening they waited for the striking of the clock it would be prayer time then and after prayers the vicar would drag himself upstairs to bed and in the peace that slid into the room when he left it gwenda would go on with her reading she had her sewing in her lap and her book bergson's evolution creatrice propped open before her on the table she sewed as she read for the vicar considered that sewing was an occupation and that reading was not he was silent as long as his daughter sewed and when she read he talked toward ten his silence would be broken by a continual sighing and yearning the vicar longed for prayer time to come and end his day but he had decreed that prayer time was ten o'clock and he would not have permitted it to come a minute sooner he nursed a book on his knees but he made no pretence of reading it he had taken off his glasses and sat with his hands folded in an attitude of utter resignation to his own will in the kitchen essie gale sat by the dying fire and waited for the stroke of ten and as she waited she stitched at the torn breeches of her little son essie had come back to the house where she had been turned away for her mother was wanted by mrs greatorex at upthorne and what mrs greatorex wanted she got there were two more children now at the farm and work enough for three women in the house and essie with all her pride had not been too proud to come back she had no feeling but pity for the old man her master who had bullied her and put her to shame if it pleased god to afflict him that was god's affair and even as a devout wesleyan essie considered that god had about done enough as essie sat and stitched she smiled thinking of greatorex's son who lay in her bed in the little room over the kitchen miss gwenda let her have him with her on the nights when mrs gale slept up at the farm it was quiet in the vicarage kitchen the door into the back yard was shut the door that essie used to keep open when she listened for a footstep and a whisper that door had betrayed her many a time when the wind slammed it too essie's heart was quiet as the heart of her sleeping child she had forgotten how madly it had leaped to her lover's footsteps how it had staggered at the slamming of the door she had forgotten the tears that she had shed when alice's wild music had rocked the house and what the vicar had said to her that night when she spilled the glass of water in the study but she remembered that gwenda had given her son his first little sunday suit and that before jimmy came when essie was in bed crying with a face ache she had knocked at her door and said what is it essie can i do anything for you she could hear her saying it now essie's memory was like that she had thought of gwenda just then because she heard the sound of dr rowcliffe's motor-car tearing up the dale the woman in the other room heard it too she had heard its horn hooting on the moor road nearly a mile away she raised her hand and listened it hooted again once twice placably at the turning of the road under carva she shivered at the sound it hooted irritably furiously as the car tore through the village its lamp swung a shaft of light over the low garden wall at the garden gate the car made a shuddering pause gwenda's face and all her body listened a little unborn undying hope quivered in her heart always at that pausing of the car at her gate it hardly gave her time for one heartbeat before she heard the grinding of the gear as the car took the steep hill to upthorne but she was always taken in by it she had always that insane hope that the course of things had changed and that stephen had really stopped at the gate and was coming to her it was insanity for she knew that rowcliffe would never come to see her in the evening now after his outburst more than five years ago there was no use pretending to each other that they were safe he had told her plainly that if she wanted him to hold out he must never be long alone with her at any time and he must give up coming to see her late at night it was much too risky when i can come and see you that way he had said it'll mean that i've left off caring but i'll look in every wednesday if i can every wednesday as long as i live he had come now and then not on a wednesday but that way he had not been able to help it but he had left longer and longer intervals between and he had never come that way since last year when his second child was born nothing but life or death would bring rowcliffe out in his car after nightfall 
yet the thing had her every time and it was as if her heart was ground with the grinding and torn with the tearing of the car then she said to herself i must end it somehow it's horrible to go on caring like this he was right it would be better not to see him at all and she began counting the days and the hours till wednesday when she would see him end of section twenty recording by expatriate in bangor maine section twenty one chapters fifty nine through sixty one of the three sisters by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter fifty nine wednesday was still the vicar's day for visiting his parish it was also rowcliffe's day for visiting his daughter but the vicar was not going to change it on that account on wednesday if it was a fine afternoon she was always sure of having rowcliffe to herself rowcliffe himself had become the creature of unalterable habit she was conscious now of the normal pulse of time a steady pulse that beat with a large rhythm a measure of seven days from wednesday to wednesday she filled the days between with reading and walking and parish work there had been changes in garthdale mr grierson had got married in one of his bursts of enthusiasm and had gone away his place had been taken by mr macy the strenuous son of a durlingham grocer mr macy had got into the church by sheer strenuousness and had married strenuously a sharp and sallow wife between them they left very little parish work for gwenda she had become a furious reader she liked hard stuff that her brain could bite on it fell on a book and gutted it throwing away the trash she read all the modern poets and novelists she cared about english and foreign they left her stimulated but unsatisfied there were not enough good ones to keep her going she worked through the elizabethan dramatists and all the vicar's tudor classics and came on jowett's translations of the platonic dialogues by the way and was lured on the quest of ultimate reality and found that there was nothing like thought to keep you from thinking she took to metaphysics as you take to dram drinking she must have strong heavy stuff that drugged her brain and when she found that she could trust her intellect she set it deliberately to fight her passion at first it was an even match for gwenda's intellect like her body was robust it generally held its ground from thursday morning till tuesday night but the night that followed wednesday afternoon would see its overthrow this wednesday it fought gallantly till the very moment of stephen's arrival she was still reading bergson and her brain struggled to make out the sense and rhythm of the sentences across the beating of her heart after seven years her heart still beat at stephen's coming it remained an excitement and adventure for she never knew how he would be sometimes he hadn't a word to say to her and left her miserable sometimes after a hard day's work he would be tired and heavy she saw him middle-aged and her heart would ache for him sometimes he would be young almost as he used to be she knew that he was only young for her he was young because he loved her she had never seen him so with mary sometimes he would be formal and frigid he talked to her as a man talks to a woman he is determined to keep at a distance she hated stephen then as passion hates he had come before now in a downright bad temper and was the old irritable stephen who found fault with everything she said and did and she had loved him for it as she had loved the old stephen it was his queer way of showing that he loved her but he had not been like that for a very long time he had grown gentler as he had grown older to-day he showed her more than one of his familiar moods she took them gladly as so many signs of his unchanging nature he still kept up his way of coming in the careful closing of the door the slight pause there by the threshold the look that sought her and that held her for an instant before their hands met she saw it still as the look that pleaded with her while it caressed her that said i know we oughtn't to be so pleased to see each other but we can't help it can we it was the look of his romantic youth as long as she saw it there it was nothing to her that rowcliffe had changed physically that he moved more heavily that his keenness and his slenderness were going that she saw also a slight thickening of his fine nose a perceptible slackening of the taut muscles of his mouth and a decided fullness about his jaw and chin 
she saw all these things but she did not see that his romantic youth lay dying in the pathos of his eyes and that if it pleaded still it pleaded forgiveness for the sin of dying his hand fell slackly from hers as she took it it was as if they were still on their guard still afraid of each other's touch as he sat in the chair that faced hers he held his hands clasped loosely in front of him and looked at them with a curious attention as if he wondered what kind of hands they were that could resist holding her when he saw that she was looking at him they fell apart with a nervous gesture they picked up the book she had laid down and turned it his eyes examined the title page their pathos lightened and softened it became compassion they smiled at her with a little pitiful smile half tender half ironic as if they said poor gwenda is that what you're driven to he opened the book and turned the pages reading a little here and there he scowled his look changed it darkened it was angry resentful inimical the dying youth in it came a little nearer to death rowcliffe had found that he could not understand what he had read huh. what do you addle your brains with that stuff for he said it amuses me oh so long as you're amused he pushed away the book that had offended him they talked about the vicar about alice about rowcliffe's children about the changes in the dale the coming of the macy's and the going of young grierson he wasn't a bad chap grierson he softened remembering grierson i can't think why you didn't care about him and at the thought of how gwenda might have cared for grierson and hadn't cared his youth revived it came back into his eyes and lit them it passed into his scowling face and caressed and smoothed it to the perfect look of reminiscent satisfaction rowcliffe did not know neither did she how his egoism hung upon her passion how it drew from it food and fire he raised his head and squared his shoulders with the unconscious gesture of his male pride it was then that she saw for the first time that he wore the black tie and had the black band of mourning on his sleeve oh stephen what do you wear that for this my poor old uncle died last week not the one i saw when at mary's wedding no another one my father's brother he paused it's made a great difference to me and mary he said it gravely mournfully almost she looked at him with tender eyes i'm sorry stephen he smiled faintly sorry are you yes if you cared for him i'm afraid i didn't very much it's not as if i'd seen a lot of him you said it's made a difference so it has he's left me a good four hundred a year oh that sort of difference my dear girl four hundred a year makes all the difference it's no use pretending that it doesn't i'm not pretending you sounded sorry and i was sorry for you that was all at that his egoism winced it was as if she had accused him of pretending to be sorry he looked at her sharply his romantic youth died in that look silence fell between them but she was used to that she even welcomed it stephen's silences brought him nearer to her than his speech essie came in with the tea-tray he lingered uneasily after the meal glancing now and then at the clock she was used to that too she also had her eyes on the clock measuring the priceless moments is anything worrying you stephen she said presently why do i look worried not exactly but you don't look well i'm getting a bit rusty that's what's the matter with me i want some hard work to rub me up and put a polish on me and i can't get it here i've never had enough to do since i left leeds harker was a wise chap to stick to it it would do me all the good in the world if i went back then she said you'll have to go stephen she did not know in her isolation that rowcliffe had been going about saying that sort of thing for the last seven years she thought it was the formidable discovery of time you ought to go if you feel like that about it why don't you i don't know you do know she did not look at him as she spoke so she missed his bewilderment you know why you stayed stephen he understood he remembered the dull red of his face flushed with the shock of the memory do i he said i made you his flush darkened but he gave no other sign of having heard her i don't know why i'm staying now he rose and looked at his watch i must be going home he said he turned at the threshold i forgot to give you mary's message 
she sent her love and she wants to know when you're coming again to see the babies oh some day soon you must make it very soon or they won't be babies any more she's dying to show them to you she showed them to me the other day she says it's ages since you've been and if she says it is she thinks it is gwenda was silent i'm coming all right tell her well but what day we'd better fix it don't come on a tuesday or a friday i'll be out i must come when i can chapter sixty she went on a tuesday she had had tea with her father first meal-time had become sacred to the vicar and he hated her to be away for any one of them she walked the four miles going across the moor under carva and loitering by the way and it was past six before she reached morfe she was shown into the room that was once rowcliffe's study it had been mary's drawing-room ever since last year when the second child was born and they turned the big room over the dining-room into a day nursery mary had made it snug and gay with cushions and shining florid chintzes there were a great many things in rosewood and brass a piano took the place of rowcliffe's writing-table a bureau and a cabinet stood against the wall where his bookcases had been and a tall palm-tree in a pot filled the little window that looked on to the orchard she had only to close her eyes and shut out these objects and she saw the room as it used to be she closed them now and instantly she opened them again for the vision hurt her she went restlessly about the room picking up things and looking at them without seeing them in the room upstairs she heard the cries of rowcliffe's children bumping and the scampering of feet she stood still then and clenched her hands the pain at her heart was like no other pain it was as if she hated rowcliffe's children presently she would have to go up and see them she waited mary was taking her own time upstairs the doors opened and shut on the sharp grief of little children carried unwillingly to bed gwenda's heart melted and grew tender at the sound but its tenderness was more unbearable to her than its pain the maid-servant came to the door mrs rowcliffe says will you please go upstairs to the night nursery miss gwenda she can't leave the children that was the message mary invariably sent she left the children for hours together when other visitors were there she could never leave them for a minute when her sister came unless stephen happened to be in then mary would abandon whatever she was doing and hurry to the two in the last year gwenda had never found herself alone with stephen for ten minutes in his house if mary couldn't come at once she sent the nurse in with the children upstairs in the night nursery mary sat in the nurse's low chair her year-old baby sprawled naked in her lap the elder infant stood whining under the nurse's hands mary had changed a little in three and a half years she was broader and stouter the tender rose had hardened over her high cheekbones her face still kept its tranquil brooding but her slow gray eyes had a secret tremor they were almost alert as if she were on the watch and mary's mouth with its wide turned back lips had lost its subtlety it had coarsened slightly and loosened under her senses continual content gwenda brushed mary's mouth lightly with the winged arch of her upper lip mary laughed you don't know how to kiss she said if you're going to treat baby that way and molly too gwenda stooped over the soft red down of the baby's head to gwenda it was as if her heart kept her hands off rowcliffe's children as if her flesh shrank from their flesh while her lips brushed theirs in tenderness and repulsion but seeing them was always worse in anticipation than reality for there was no trace of rowcliffe in his children the little red-haired white-faced things were all carteret molly the elder had a look of ally sullen and sickly as if some innermost reluctance had held back the impulse that had given it being even the younger child showed fragile as if implacable memory had come between it and perfect life gwenda did not know why her fierceness was appeased by this unlikeness nor why she wanted to see mary and nothing but mary in rowcliffe's children nor why she refused to think of them as his she only knew that to see rowcliffe and mary's children would have been more than her flesh and blood could bear you've come just in time to see baby in her bath said mary i seem to be always in time for that well you're not in time to see stephen he won't be home till nine at least i didn't expect to see him he told me he'd be out she saw the hidden watcher in mary's eyes looking out at her 
when did he tell you that last wednesday the watcher hid again suddenly appeased mary busied herself with the washing of her babies she did it thoroughly and efficiently with no sentimental tendernesses but with soft sensual paddings and strokings of the white satin smooth skins and when they were tucked into their cots and disposed of for the night mary turned to gwenda come into my room a minute she said mary's joy was to take her sister into her room and watch her to see if she would flinch before the signs of stephen's occupation she drew her attention to these if gwenda seemed likely to miss any of them we've had the beds turned she said the light hurt stephen's eyes i can't say i like sleeping with my head out in the middle of the room why don't you lie the other way then my dear stephen wouldn't like that oh what a mess my hair's in she turned to the glass and smoothed her disordered waves and coils while she kept her eyes fixed on gwenda's image there appraising her clothes her slenderness and straightness the set of her head on her shoulders the air that she kept up of almost insolent adolescence she noted the delicate lines on her forehead and at the corners of her eyes she saw that her small defiant face was still white and firm and that her eyes looked violet blue with the dark shadows under them time was the only power that had been good to gwenda she ought to look more battered mary thought she does carry it off well and she's only two years younger than i am it's her figure really not her face she's got more lines than i have but if i wore that long straight coat i should look awful in it it's all very well for you she said you haven't had two children no i haven't but what's all very well the good looks you contrive to keep my dear nobody would know you were thirty-three i shouldn't molly if you didn't remind me every time mary flushed you'll say next that's why you don't come why i don't come yes it's been ages since you've been here that was always mary's cry i haven't much time molly for coming on the off chance the off chance as if i'd never asked you you can go to alice poor ally wouldn't have anybody to show the baby to if i didn't you haven't seen one of ally's babies i can't gwenda i must think of the children i can't let them grow up with little greatorexes there are three of them aren't there didn't you know there'd been another stephen did tell me she had rather a bad time hadn't she she had molly it wouldn't do you any harm now to go and see her i think it's horrid of you not to it's such rotten humbug why you used to say i was ten times more awful than poor little ally there are moments gwenda when i think you are moments you always did think it you think it still and yet you'll have me here but you won't have her just because she's gone a technical howler and i haven't you haven't but you'd have gone a worse one if you'd had the chance gwenda raised her head you know molly that that isn't true i said if i suppose you think you had your chance then i don't think anything except that i've got to go you haven't you're going to stay for dinner now you're here i can't really mary but mary was obstinate whether her sister stayed or went she made it hard for her she kept it up on the stairs and at the door and at the garden gate perhaps you'll come some night when stephen's here you know he's always glad to see you the sting of it was in mary's watching eyes for when you came to think of it there was nothing else she could very well have said chapter sixty one that year when spring warmed into summer gwenda's strength went from her she was always tired she fought with her fatigue and got the better of it but in a week or two it returned rowcliffe told her to rest and she rested for a day or two lying on the couch in the dining-room where ally used to lie and when she felt better she crawled out on to the moor and lay there one day she said to herself there's ally i'll go and see how she's getting on she dragged herself up the hill to upthorne it was a day of heat and hidden sunlight the moor and the marshes were drenched in the grey june mist the hillside wore soft vapour like a cloak hiding its nakedness at the top of the three fields the nave of the old barn showed as if lifted up and withdrawn into the distance but it was no longer solitary the thorn-tree beside it had burst into white flower it shimmered far off under the mist in the dim green field like a magic thing half hidden and about to disappear remaining only for the hour of its enchantment 
it gave her the same subtle and mysterious joy that she had had on the night she and rowcliffe walked together and saw the thorn trees on greffington edge white under the hidden moon the grey farmhouse was changed for jim greatorex had got on he had built himself another granary on the north side of the mistal he built it long and low of hewn stone with a corrugated iron roof and he had made himself two fine new rooms a dining-room and a nursery one above the other within the blind walls of the house where the old granary had been the walls were blind no longer for he had knocked four large windows out of them and it was as if one half of the house were awake and staring while the other half in its old and alien beauty dozed and dreamed under its scowling mullions as gwenda came to it she wondered how the farm could ever have seemed sinister and ghost-haunted it had become so entirely the place of happy life loud noises came from the open windows of the dining-room where the family were at tea the barking of dogs the competitive laughter of small children a gurgling and crowing and spluttering but now and then the sudden delicate laughter of ally and the bellowing of jim oh there's gwenda said ally jim stopped between a bellowing and a choking for his mouth was full ay it's her he washed down his mouthful come ally and open the door to her but ally did not come she had her year-old baby on her knees and was feeding him at the door of the old kitchen jim grasped his sister-in-law by the hand that's right he said you've just come in time for a cup of tea the missus is in there with the little ones he jerked his thumb toward his dining-room and led the way there jim was not quite so alert and slender as he had been he had lost his savage grace but he moved with his old directness and dignity and he still looked at you with his pathetic mystic gaze ally was contrite she raised her face to her sister to be kissed i can't get up she said i'm feeding baby he'd howl if i left off i'd let him howl i'd spank him if it was me said jim he wouldn't gwenda ay that i would and he knows it does johnny the young rascal gwenda kissed the four children jimmy and gwendolen alice and little stephen and the baby john they lifted little sticky faces and wiped them on gwenda's face and the happy din went on ally didn't seem to mind it she had grown plump and pink and rather like mary without her subtlety she sat smiling tranquil among the cries of her offspring jim turned three dogs out into the yard by way of discipline he and ally tried to talk to each other across the tumult that remained now and then ally and the children talked to gwenda they told her that the black and white cow had calved and that the blue lupins had come up in the garden that the old sow had died that jenny the chintz cat had kittened and that the lop-eared rabbit had a litter and baby's got another tooth said ally i'm breaking in the young chestnut said jim poor daisy's getting past her work all these happenings were exciting and wonderful to ally but you're not interested gwenda i am darling i am she was ally knew it but she wanted perpetual reassurance but you never tell us anything there's nothing to tell nothing happens oh come said ally how's papa much the same except that he drove into morf yesterday to see molly yes darling of course you may ally was abstracted for gwenny had slipped from her chair and was whispering in her ear it never occurred to ally to ask what gwenda had been doing or what she had been thinking of or what she felt or to listen to anything she had to say her sister might just as well not have existed for all the interest ally showed in her she hadn't really forgotten what gwenda had done for her but she couldn't go on thinking about it forever it was the sort of thing that wasn't easy or agreeable to think about and ally's instinct of self-preservation urged her to turn from it she tended to forget it and she tended to forget all dreadful things such as her own terrors and her father's illness and the noises greatorex made when he was eating gwenda was used to this apathy of ally's and it had never hurt her till to-day to-day she wanted something from ally she didn't know what it was exactly but it was something ally hadn't got she only said have you seen the thorn trees on greffington edge and ally never answered she was heading off a stream of jam that was creeping down stevie's chin to plunge into his neck gwenda's asking you have you seen the thorn trees on greffington edge said greatorex he spoke to ally as if she were deaf she made a desperate effort to detach herself from stevie the thorn trees has anybody set fire to them a silly lass what about the thorn trees gwenda only that they're all in flower gwenda said 
She didn't know where it had come from, the sudden impulse to tell Ally about the beauty of the thorn trees. But the impulse had gone. She thought sadly, they want me, but they don't want me for myself. They don't want to talk to me. They don't know what to say. They don't know anything about me. They don't care, really. Jim likes me because I've stuck to Ally. Ally loves me because I would have given Stephen to her. They love what I was, not what I am now, nor what I shall be. They have nothing for me. It was Jim who answered her. I know, he said, I know. Oh, you little, little lamb. Baby John had his fingers in his mother's hair. Greatorex rose. You'll not get much out of Allie as long as the kids are about. You'd best come with me into the garden and see the lupins. She went with him. He was silent as they threaded the garden path together. She thought, I know why I like him. They came to a standstill at the south wall, where the tall blue lupins rose between them, vivid in the tender air and very still. Greatorex also was still. His eyes looked away over the blue spires of the lupins to the naked hillside. They saw neither the hillside nor anything between. When he spoke, his voice was thick, almost as though he were in love or intoxicated. I know what you mean about those thorn trees. Tisn't no earthly beauty what you see in em. Jim, she said, shall I always see it? I dunno. It comes and it goes, does such like. What makes it come? What makes it come? You know better than I can tell you. If I only did know, I'm afraid it's going. I can tell you this for your comfort. If you suffer enough, maybe it'll come to you again. If you're snug and happy, sure as death, it'll go. He paused. It hasn't come to me since I married Allie. She was wrong about Jim. He had not forgotten her. He was not saying these things for himself. He was saying them for her, getting them out of himself with pain and difficulty. It was odd to think that nobody but she understood Jim, and that nobody but Jim had ever really understood her. Stephen didn't understand her, any more than Allie understood her husband, and it made no difference to her, and it made no difference to Jim. I'll tell you another queer thing. It hasn't got much to do with good and bad. The drink will not drive it from you, and sin will not drive it from you. So I reckon it's much the same thing as the grace of God. Did the grace of God go away from you when you were married, Jim? Maybe it would have if I'd run after it. Tis a tricky thing, is God's grace. But it's gone, she said. You gave your soul for Allie when you married her. He smiled. I told her I'd give my soul to marry her, he said. End of section 21 Recording by Expatria in Bangor, Maine Section 22, chapters 62 to 66 of The Three Sisters by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 62. As she went home, she tried to recapture the magic of the flowering thorn trees, but it had gone, and she could not be persuaded that it would come again. She was still too young to draw joy from the memory of joy and what Greatorex had told her seemed incredible. She said to herself, is it going to be taken from me like everything else? And a dreadful duologue went on in her. It looks like it. But it was mine. It was mine like nothing else. It never had anything for you but what you gave it. Am I to go on giving the whole blessed time? Am I never to have anything for myself? There never is anything for anybody but what they give or what they take from somebody else you should have taken you had your chance i'd have died rather do you call this living i have lived he hasn't why did you sacrifice him for mary it wasn't for mary it was for yourself for your own wretched soul for his soul how much do you suppose mary cares about his soul it would have had a chance with you it's one chance the unconsoling voice had the last word for it was not in answer to it that a certain phrase came into her brooding mind. I couldn't do a caddish thing like that. It puzzled her. She had said it to Stephen that night, but it came to her now attached to an older memory. Somebody had said it to her before then, years before. She remembered. It was Allie. Chapter 63 A year passed. It was June again. 
For more than a year there had been rumors of changes in Morfe. The doctor talked of going. He was always talking of going, and nobody had yet believed that he would go. This time, they said, he was serious. It had been a toss-up whether he stayed or went. But in the end, he stayed. Things had happened in Rowcliffe's family. His mother had died, and his wife had had a son. Rowcliffe's son was the image of Rowcliffe. The doctor had no brothers or sisters, and by his mother's death he came into possession both of his father's income and of hers. He had now more than a thousand, a year over and above what he earned. On an unearned thousand a year you can live like a rich man in Rathdale. Not that Rowcliffe had any idea of giving up. He was well under forty, and as soon as old Hislop at Rayburn died or retired, he would step into his practice. He hadn't half enough to do in Morfe, and he wanted more. Meanwhile, he had bought the house that joined on to his own, and thrown the two and their gardens into one. They had been one twenty years ago when the wide-fronted building with its long rows of windows was the dominating house in Morfe Village. Rowcliffe was now the dominating man in it. He had given the old place back its own. And he had spent any amount of money on it. He had had all the woodwork painted white, and the whole house repapered and redecorated. He had laid down parquet flooring in the big square hall that he had made, and in the new drawing-room upstairs, and he had bought a great deal of beautiful and expensive furniture. And now he was building a garage and laying out a croquet ground and tennis lawns at the back. He and Mary had been superintending these works all afternoon, till a shower sent them indoors. And now they were sitting together in the drawing-room, in the breathing space that came between the children's hour and dinner mary had sent the children back to the nursery a little earlier than usual rowcliffe had complained of headache he was always complaining of headaches they dated from his marriage and more particularly from one night in june eight years ago but rowcliffe ignored the evidence of dates he ignored everything that made him feel uncomfortable he had put gwenda from him he had said plainly to mary in one poignant moment not long before the birth of their third child if you're worrying about me and gwenda you needn't she was never anything to me that was not saying there had never been anything between them but mary knew what he had meant he said to himself and mary said that he had got over it but he hadn't got over it he might say to himself and mary she was never anything to me he might put her and the thought of her away from him but she had left her mark on him he hadn't put her away. She was there, in his heavy eyes, and in the irritable gestures of his hands, in his nerves, and in his wounded memory. She had knitted herself into his secret being. Mary was unaware of the cause of his malady. If it had been suggested to her that he had got into this state because of Gwenda, she would have dismissed the idea with contempt. She didn't worry about Rowcliffe's state. On the contrary, Rowcliffe's state was a consolation and a satisfaction to her for all that she had endured through gwenda she would have thought you mad if you had told her so for she was sorry for stephen and tender to him when he was nervous or depressed but to mary her sorrow and her tenderness were a voluptuous joy she even encouraged rowcliffe in his state she liked to make it out worse than it really was so that he might become more dependent on her and she had found that it could be induced in him by suggestion she had only to say to him stephen you're thoroughly worn out and he was thoroughly worn out she had more pleasure because she had more confidence in this lethargic middle-aged rowcliffe than in rowcliffe young and energetic his youth had attracted him to gwenda and his energy had driven him out of doors and mary had set herself secretly insidiously to destroy them it had taken her seven years for the first five years it had been hard work for mary it had meant for her body an ignominious waiting and watching for the moment when its appeal would be irresistible, for her soul a complete subservience to her husband's moods, and for her mind perpetual attention to his comfort, a thousand cares that had seemed to go unnoticed. But in the sixth year they had begun to tell. Once Rowcliffe had made up his mind that Gwenda couldn't be anything to him, he had let go, and through sheer exhaustion had fallen more and more into his wife's hands and for the last two years her labor had been easy and its end sure. She had him, bound to her bed and to her fireside. He said and thought that he was happy. He meant that he was extremely comfortable. Is your head very bad, Stephen? 
He shook his head. It wasn't very bad, but he was worried. He was worried about himself. From time to time his old self rose against this new self that was the slave of comfort. It made desperate efforts to shake off the strangling lethargy. When he went about saying that he was getting rusty, that he ought never to have left Leeds, and that it would do him all the good in the world to go back there, he was saying what he knew to be the truth. The life he was leading was playing the devil with his nerves and brain. His brain had nothing to do. Hard work might not be the cure for every kind of nervous trouble, but it was the one cure for the kind that he had got. He ought to have gone away seven years ago. It was Gwenda's fault that he hadn't gone. He felt a dull anger against her as against a woman who had wrecked his chance. He had a chance of going now if he cared to take it. He had had a letter that morning from Dr. Harker asking if he had meant what he had said a year ago, and if he'd cared to exchange his Rathdale practice for his old practice in Leeds. Harker's wife was threatened with lung trouble, and they would have to live in the country somewhere, and Harker himself wouldn't be sorry for the exchange. His present practice was worth twice what it had been ten years ago, and it was growing. There were all sorts of interesting things to be done in Leeds by a man of Rowcliffe's keenness and energy. Do you know, Stephen, you're getting quite stout? I do know, he said, almost with bitterness. I don't mean horridly stout, dear, just nicely and comfortably stout. I'm too comfortable, he said. I don't do enough work to keep me fit. Is that what's bothering you? He frowned. It was Harker's letter that was bothering him. He said so. For one instant, Mary looked impatient. I thought we'd settled that, she said. Rowcliffe sighed. What on earth makes you want to go and leave this place when you've spent hundreds on it? I should make pots of money in Leeds. But we couldn't live there. Why not? It would be too awful. My dear, if it were a big London practice, I shouldn't say no. That might be worth while. But whatever should we have in Leeds? We haven't much here. We've got the county. You might think of the children. I do, he said mournfully. I do. I think of nothing else but the children and you. If you wouldn't like it, there's an end of it. You might think of yourself, dear. You really are not strong enough for it. He felt that he really was not. He changed the subject. I saw Gwenda the other day. Looking as young as ever, I suppose? No, not quite so young. I thought she was looking rather ill. He meditated. I wonder why she never comes. He really did wonder. It's a quarter past seven, Stephen. He rose and stretched himself. They went together to the night nursery where the three children lay in their cots, the little red-haired girls awake and restless, and the dark-haired baby in his first sleep. They bent over them together. Mary's lips touched the red hair in the dark where Stephen's lips had been. They spent the evening sitting by the fire in Rowcliffe's study. The doctor dozed. Mary, silent over her sewing, was the perfect image of tranquility. From time to time she looked at her husband and smiled as his chin dropped to his breast and recovered itself with a start. At the stroke of ten she murmured, Stephen, are you ready for bed? He rose, stumbling for drowsiness. As they passed into the square hall he paused and looked round him before putting out the lights. Yes, he yawned, yes, I think we shall do very comfortably here for the next seven years. He was thinking of old Hislop. He had given him seven years. Chapter 64 The next day, it was a Friday, when Mary came home to tea after a round of ineffectual calling, she was told that Miss Gwenda was in the drawing-room. Mary inquired whether the doctor was in. Dr. Rowcliffe was in, but he was engaged in the surgery. Mary thought she knew why Gwenda had come today. For the last two or three Wednesdays, Rowcliffe had left Garthdale without calling at the vicarage. He had not meant to break his habit, but it happened so. For, this year, Mary had decided to have a day from May to October, and her day was Wednesday. Her sister had ignored her day, and Mary was offended. She had every reason. Mary believed in keeping up appearances, and the appearance she most desired to keep up was that of behaving beautifully to her sister. This required her sister's cooperation, it couldn't appear if Gwenda didn't, and Gwenda hadn't given it a chance. She meant to have it out with her. She greeted her, therefore, with a certain challenge. What are you keeping away for? Do you suppose we aren't glad to see you? I'm not keeping away, said Gwenda. It looks uncommonly like it. Do you know it's two months since you've been here? Is it? 
I've lost count. I should think you did lose count. I'm sorry, Molly, I couldn't come. You talk as if you had engagements every day in Garthdale. If it comes to that, it's months since you've been to us. It's different for me. I have engagements, and I've my husband and children, too. Stephen hates it if I'm out when he comes home. And Papa hates it if I'm out. It's no use minding what Papa hates. What's making you so sensitive? Living with him. Then for goodness sake, get away from him when you can. One afternoon here can't matter to him. Gwenda said nothing, neither did she look at her. But she answered her in her heart, It matters to me. It matters to me. How stupid you are if you don't see how it matters. Yet I'd die rather than you should see. Mary went on, exasperated by her sister's silence. We may as well have it out while we're about it. Why can't you look me straight in the face and say plump out what I've done? You've done nothing. Well, is it Stephen, then? Has he done anything? Of course he hasn't. What could he do? Poor Stephen, goodness knows. I'm sure I don't. No more does he, unless... She stopped. Her sister was looking her straight in the face now. Unless what? My dear Gwenda, don't glare at me like that. I'm not saying things, and I'm not thinking them. I don't know what you're thinking. If you weren't so nervy, you'd own that I've always been decent to you. I'm sure I have been. I've always stood up for you. I've always wanted to have you here. And why shouldn't you? Mary blinked. She had seen her blunder. I never said you weren't decent to me, Molly. You behave as if I weren't. How am I to behave? I know it's difficult, said Mary. The memory of her blunder rankled. Are you offended because Stephen hasn't been to see you? My dear Molly, Mary ignored her look of weary tolerance. Because you can't expect him to keep on running up to Garthdale when Papa's all right. I don't expect him. Well then, said Mary, with the air of having exhausted all plausible interpretations. If I were offended, said Gwenda, should I be here? The appearance of the tea-tray and the parlour-maid absolved Mary from the embarrassing compulsion to reply. She addressed herself to the parlour-maid. Tell Dr. Rowcliffe that tea is ready, and that Miss Gwendolen is here. She really wanted Stephen to come and deliver her from the situation she had created, but Rowcliffe delayed his coming. Is it true that Stephen's going to give up his practice? Gwenda said presently. Well, no. Whatever he does, he won't do that, said Mary. She thought, so that's what she came for. Stephen hasn't told her anything. What put that idea into your head, she asked. Somebody told me so. He has had an offer of Dr. Harker's practice in Leeds, and he'd some idea of taking it. He seemed to think it might be a good thing. There was a flicker in the whiteness of Gwenda's face. It arrested Mary. It was not excitement, nor dismay, nor eagerness, nor even interest. It was a sort of illumination, the movement of some inner light, the shining passage of some idea, and in Gwenda's attitude as it now presented itself to Mary, there was a curious still withdrawal and detachment. She seemed hardly to listen, but to be preoccupied with her idea. He thought it would be a good thing, she said. I think I've convinced him, said Mary, that it wouldn't. Gwenda was stiller and more withdrawn than ever, guarding her idea. Can I see Stephen before I go, she said presently. Of course, he'll be up in a second. I can't, here. Mary stared. She understood. You're ill. Poor dear, you shall see him this minute. She rang the bell. Chapter 65 Five minutes passed before Rowcliffe came to Gwenda in the study. Forgive me, he said. I had a troublesome patient. Don't be afraid. You're not going to have another. Come, you haven't troubled me much, anyhow. This is the first time, isn't it? Yes, she thought, it was the first time, and it would be the last. There had not been many ways of seeing Stephen, but this way had always been open to her, if she had cared to take it. But it had been, of all ways, the most repugnant to her, and she had never taken it till now when she was driven to it. Mary tells me you're not feeling very fit. He was utterly gentle, as he was with all sick and suffering things. I'm all right. That's not why I want to see you. He was faintly surprised. What is it, then? Sit down and tell me. She sat down. They had Stephen's table as a barrier between them. You've been thinking of leaving Rathdale, haven't you, she said. I've been thinking of leaving it for the last seven years, but I haven't left it yet. I don't suppose I shall leave it now. Even when you've got the chance? 
even when i've got the chance you said you wanted to go and you do don't you well yes for some things would you think me an awful brute if i said i wanted you to go he gave her a little queer puzzled look i wouldn't think you a brute whatever you wanted do you mind my smoking a cigarette no she waited stephen i wish i hadn't made you stay you're not making me stay i mean that time do you remember he smiled a little smile of reminiscent tenderness yes yes i remember i didn't understand stephen well well there's no need to go back on that now it's done gwenda yes and i did it i wouldn't have done it if i'd known what it meant i didn't think it would have been like this like what rowcliffe's smile that had been reminiscent was now vague and obscurely speculative i ought to have let you go when you wanted to she said rowcliffe looked down at the table she sat leaning sideways against it one thin arm was stretched out on it the hand gripped the paperweight that he had pushed away it was this hand so tense and yet so helpless that he was looking at he laid his own over it gently its grip slackened then it lay lax under the sheltering hand don't worry about that my dear he said it's been all right it hasn't it hasn't rowcliffe's nerves winced before her fierce intensity he withdrew his sheltering hand just at first she said it was all right but you see it's broken down you said it would you mustn't keep on bothering about what i said it isn't what you said it's what is it's this place we're all tied up together in it tight we can't get away from each other it isn't as if i could leave i'm stuck here with papa my dear gwenda did i ever say you ought to leave no you said you ought it's the same thing it isn't and i don't say it now what is the earthly use of going back on things that's what makes you ill put it straight out of your mind you know i can't help you if you go on like this you can my dear i wish i knew how you asked me to stay and i stayed i can understand that if i asked you to go would you go stephen would you understand that too my dear child what good would that do you i want you to go stephen you want me to go he screwed up his eyes as if he were trying to see the thing clearly yes she said he shook his head he had given it up no my dear you don't want me to go you only think you do you don't know what you want i shouldn't say it if i didn't wouldn't you it's exactly what you would say do you suppose i don't know you she had both her arms stretched before him on the table now the hands were clasped the little thin hands implored him her eyes implored him in the tense clasp and in the gaze there was the passion of entreaty that she kept out of her voice but rowcliffe did not see it he had shifted his position sinking a little lower into his chair and his head was bowed before her his eyes sombrely reflective looked straight in front of him under their bent brows he seemed to be really considering whether he would go or stay no he said presently no i'm not going but he was dubious and deliberate it was as if he still weighed it still watched for the turning of the scale the clock across the market-place struck eight he gathered himself together and it was then as if the strokes falling on his ear set free some blocked movement in his brain no he said i don't see how i can go as things are besides it isn't necessary i see she said she rose she gave him a long look a look that was still incredulous of what it saw his eyes refused to meet it as he rose also they stood so for a moment without any speech but that of eyes lifted and eyes lowered still without a word she turned from him to the door he sprang to open it five minutes later he was aware that his wife had come into the room has gwenda gone he said yes stephen there was a small fluttering fright in mary's eyes is there anything the matter with her no he said nothing except living with your father chapter sixty six gwenda had no feeling in her as she left rowcliffe's house her heart hid in her breast it was so mortally wounded as to be unaware that it was hurt but at the turn of the white road her heart stirred in its hiding-place it stirred at the sight of carva and with the wind that brought her the smell of the flowering thorn-trees 
it discerned in these things a power that would before long make her suffer she had no other sense of them she came to the drop of the road under karva where she had seen rowcliffe for the first time she thought i shall never get away from it far off in the bottom the village waited for her it had always waited for her but she was afraid of it now afraid of what it might have in store for her it shared her fear as it crouched there like a beaten thing with its huddled houses naked and blackened as if fire had passed over them and essie gale stood at the vicarage gate and waited she had her child at her side the two were looking for gwenda i thought maybe something had happened to you she said as if she had seen what had happened to her she hurried the child in out of her sight ten minutes to ten in the small dull room gwenda waited for the hour of her deliverance she had taken up her sewing and her book the vicar sat silent waiting he too with his hands folded on his lap and loud through the quiet house she heard the sound of crying and essie's voice scolding her little son avenging on him the cruelty of life on greffington edge under the risen moon the white thorn trees flowered in their glory End of chapter sixty six recording by expatriate in bangor maine end of the three sisters by may sinclair